Hello. 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 Welcome. 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 If you've uh, just stumbled on this because of autoplay, one, two, three, you're back in the room. Welcome. Uh, welcome once more to uh, the China Zone. China. Uh, my name is Lord Hard Thrasher. I was winner of the 1996 trophy for man most likely to become a tin pot dictator at my public school. Unfortunately, life has been a series of disappointments to me, which has culminated in my speaking to you now through the internet. Uh, some time ago, I, along with pretty much everyone else with a grain of sanity, became aware of Russia's war in Ukraine and the problems that it might present for the long-term ambitions for China, and I rather foolishly thought I would attempt to analyse the situation. You will then, if you are so minded, find a few other videos on my channel, which came before this one, uh, which kind of lay the groundwork. They're not essential for you to watch first, but it might help you understand China today in a bit more detail, how we got here, and for the first time in more than 2,000 years, how China is now looking at a world stage led by a man with the charisma of the colour beige. I have in episodes past shown how Xi Jinping's usurpation of an already dictatorial and murderous regime is an unprecedented step since the time of Mao, which of course killed 30 million people and led to the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. I've also discussed why China still thinks of itself as a Marxist state, even if it has the trappings of a capitalist economy. Uh, today we're going to talk about what China wants and how it's going about getting it, and what the implications might be for the US, for Ukraine, for Russia, for the rest of the world, and of course for China itself. If we start at brass tacks, then it's fair to say that China's goals are notoriously opaque, and decisions are made behind a hermetically sealed set of doors which allow for no external scrutiny at all. Thus, if on a Monday President Xi wakes up with a bad hangover and bans all alcohol, by Wednesday elements of the National State Security Services will be smashing bottles of liquor on high streets all over China. There are no particular methods of oversight. There's no particular insight from external parties. All we can do is take a few educated guesses from public statements and general Chinese sentiment. In, in general terms, its primary goals appear to be to usurp the United States as the world's leading power and to once again take what it considers to be its rightful position as the heavenly kingdom and to throw off the humiliations of the couple of hundred years ago, the so-called century of humiliation, and indeed a lot of the early part of the Chinese Communist Party rule. And that means reclaiming the so-called lost territories from the Qing dynasty and becoming economically independent and, of course, creating what it would refer to as a multipolar world, which is code for pushing the US off its top pedestal. So these are all very easy and straightforward to define with no ambiguity or room for cock up at all, I don't think. Uh, China under Xi has essentially taken three distinct approaches to achieving these goals. The first, which I went through last time, basically involves looking backwards and focusing on old-fashioned communist principles of historical determinism and stability above all else. Xi is not a radical new thinker. He likes nice certain outcomes. He likes things he knows. Well, mostly. The second two strategies are basically have an extremely large military with lots of shiny new tech, and secondly, to build a fucking great big economy and combine that with massive soft power around the world. And we'll have a look at these in turn and consider what they mean. We're going to start by having a look at the economy. So, first of all, soft power, economics, China today. Economies are, to use a technical CrossFit term, the ass of the country. The military might be the boobies or the crotch, they're very nice to look at. Certain folks, folks spend an awful lot of time obsessing about them, measuring them and thinking about them in quiet rooms. But the ass controls how you walk, how fast you can run, how deep you can squat, how good you look covered in latex. And no, I didn't use that analogy just to be able to show you this photograph of Cindy Crawford from the 1990s. That was a happy coincidence. Oh, God, she was so hot. Oh, let's just take teenage me. Anyway, right, where was I? Yes, uh, economics. That'll work like an ice cube to the crotch. Right, so for now at least, the real power of China is its economic reach. Uh, with 1.4 billion people, it's been able to become by far the largest world exporter of stuff, making everything from rubber ducks to massive oil tankers. It's built up huge reserves of cash, which it's begun to use to innovate and invest in things like AI and machine learning and space exploration, and crucially, into international investments. And this is sort of classic rising superpower behaviour, really. I mean, if you look back, let's take the US as an example. Beginning of World War I, the first couple of years, the US took orders from literally, body, literally everybody for arms and equipment, and it shipped something like $2 billion of arms to Europe. That's, that's 1914 billion, so we're talking about sort of 60-ish billion in today's money, just in arms. Never mind food, oil, energy, you know, all that stuff. And then it lent a further $7 billion to Europe. In, in fairness, once it had stopped making a shitload of money, it did come in and actually help the Allies for, well, you know, a whole 18 months. And it managed to get troops to fight, you know, on the front line for, I mean, if we're being generous, about six months. So I, I guess that was something, kind of. 
win the war. They certainly didn't. Anyway, post-war, the US took all of that money that they'd earned and, of course, the massive debts that they were owed, and it used them to basically stomp the world into accepting US as the preeminent economic power, with dear old Woodrow Wilson, when he wasn't busy watching incredibly racist movies in the White House, making everybody march to the US's tune. China is trying something very similar. It's taking that 20 or 30 years, or even if you squint a bit, 40 years of economic growth, and really flexing its butt on the world stage. So the Paris Club, no, 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 not, not the one with the windmills and the ladies of negotiable virtue. No, no, not the one with the dungeons and the whips and stuff. Look, get your head out of the gutter. I'm talking economics here. Right. The Paris Club is a group of 22 countries, including Australia, Canada, Denmark, Japan, Russia, the UK, the US, and of course, France. And it was established in 1956. Its membership represented the majority of lenders of the world under French supervision, which, of course, I'm not bit about at all. Um, it helped to create to allow creditor nations to negotiate and structure, or often, more often restructure, debt of countries who might or were actually defaulting at the time. When there was a, a hullabaloo about debt cancellation around the millennium, uh, it was the Paris Club who was, oversaw the process for writing off about 30% of world debt. However, things have changed somewhat in recent times. Like a bunch of sort of posh golf club members, the Paris Club view themselves as the responsible old money of the world. And they're happy for you know, Argentina or Mexico to pop around and occasionally show up on the course of economic power, play a round or two of golf and then leave discreetly by the back door. What they weren't quite expecting was that the local loan shark, China, to make so much money that he's actually bought the place outright and suddenly changes all the rules. One minute everybody was wearing restrained check shirts and parking in their allotted parking spaces, and now someone has gold-plated the toilets, plastered the walls with one China slogans, and every now and again is breaking the legs of caddies who've made bad bets. China's loan shark record in the Global South is impressive. Since 2004, China has lent something like $500 billion to about 98 countries. For context, that's about two-thirds of global lending full stop. And this is what China refers to as the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. It's designed to create an economic partnership, or set of partnerships, I should say, with places that can secure China's in economic inputs, and also where it can have an influence on shaping global uh, strategy and global conversations. So it's worth just quickly pausing here and touching momentarily on global, global trade routes as it's, it's kind of relevant for the conversation and then following up with about the Chinese military. China has to import a great deal of stuff to keep its economy going. It's surprisingly resource poor despite its size and you would think it would have a lot of resources within inside its borders. You'd also think it, it could be relatively independent but that's simply not the case. Something like 30% of all global trade touches China at some point. The US-China relationship is worth $559 billion annually. That's an insane amount of money. And you could look at almost any part of China's economy and you can see places where it touches other countries and vice versa. You could look at any country and you can see places where it is touched by China. Now, about 80% of all this economic activity is coming by sea. And actually, it's got a lot worse as, as European markets are no longer accessible by rail across Russia, which was actually accounting for a significant amount of trade during the summer months. And obviously that's happened because of the war in Ukraine. At the sea, that 80%, is controlled by the US. Like it or not, the US Navy today is basically what the Royal Navy was in the 1800s. It has no peers or even near peers. In the event of a conflict, China's economy could be choked out at sea. So the military, and especially the naval expansion, is all about trying to keep those trade routes open. And we'll talk a bit more about the military, as I say, in a second. But it's important to understand that the BRI is, in part, about creating new overland connections that China can exploit and bypassing any naval choke points, like, for example, the Straits of Malacca, which connects the Indian Ocean to the South China Sea, and which, in theory, could be blockaded by you know three blokes in a fishing in a in, in, in a fishing vessel with a starting pistol. Um, at the same time, the BRI aims to create massive waves of soft power that cushions China's position in the world and give it control over bodies like the UN. And again, we'll talk about that in a second. BRI, let's talk a bit more about that. BRI projects can be in the form of very straightforward loans to countries or joint infrastructure projects like pipelines for gas and oil, or it can be for things like uh, import and export, balance of trade deals to help finance things. And you know, in some cases, it can literally be to establish Chinese military bases. 
So today, China has outstanding loans totaling about 250 billion US dollars to places like Sri Lanka, Mongolia, the Maldives, Laos, Angola, many of whom have debts that constitute more than 20% of their total GDP to China alone. Now, if you compare that to, say, Russia, who's lent about $27 billion over the last 30 years, you begin to see the kind of influence and the kind of scale that China has. And the rates that these countries are paying to finance groups like the Paris Club or the IMF are typically much higher than the rates that they'd wind up paying to Beijing. So BRI suddenly becomes an incredibly attractive proposition. On top of that, there aren't the kinds of checks and balances for BRI that the IMF demands. So if you want to restructure a loan, you're often asked by the IMF to explain the corruption in your country and what you're doing about it. Beijing doesn't care about that. He doesn't ask those kinds of questions, and that's incredibly attractive to certain countries. China has also been a lot less risk adverse, but the problem that it's had is it's lending to countries who are going to be necessarily ones that are struggling a bit. And so as energy and food prices have gone up, these countries have been some of the worst affected. You know, on the surface of this thing, th this looks really bad. You know, if, if China was a traditional lender, you would consider that to be very, very bad news indeed. There's a huge amount of debt that's had to be restructured. Something like two thirds of it has probably had to be restructured at some point. But it's also meant that China has one foot on the throat of a number of rising economies, which allows it huge amounts of power. Really, only the US in the 1960s has had this kind of economic power before. And indebted countries have, for example, voted with China on things like the UN Charter of Human Rights, and that's helped China to be to, to su suppress unfavorable reporting on you know, Chinese domestic controls. It's helped China get votes for, for example, its expansion into the South China Sea. It's had a number of times gone to these countries and asked for their support on economic councils. I'll give you one very recent example. Two and a half billion dollar loan to Honduras the other day was agreed. And unrelatedly, Honduras broke its relationships with Taipei two weeks later. Those two things apparently have no connection to one another, according to both Honduras and Beijing. I don't believe that for an instant. They absolutely are linked to one another. And we will see more and more of the BRI projects being used to influence China's position in the world and remodel international institutions in China's favour. And the reach of BRI and China's economy goes to some unusual places we don't tend to think about in the West. Xi Jinping Huggy Bear Ping has been rolling around Central Asian neighbourhood whilst Daddy Putin has been distracted. Huggy has been giving offers of a little sugar to Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, all of whom have fallen for his bling military and his shiny new economy. Promised to provide oil, gas, minerals and mining rights, and in Tajikistan's case, people's armed police barracks and training grounds. Daddy Putin in Moscow is being humiliated. These states are the Central European, sorry, Central Asian equivalent of Ukraine, and only, you know, a bit more dictatory and poorer. And this is a huge problem for Russia. When Huggy Xi went to Moscow recently, Putin was absolutely hoping to get a bit of China's sugar too, by finalising an oil pipeline deal. And initially, everybody in the West assumed that that's what had happened, except it didn't. An announcement by the Kremlin cited a further study was needed, and there was absolutely no mention of it in the Chinese communiques. So not just did Daddy Putin get no guns, no no ammo and no cash. He got no oil pipeline, which means that his way out of this crisis has been reduced even further. And he's actually having to go to North Korea and try and bribe them with food in exchange for weapons. I would weep for him, but the guy's a cockwomble, so fuck him. And I hope someone slips him some polonium nice and soon. Furthermore, Russia's equivalent of NATO, the CSTO, which was designed by Moscow to give some military control and also mutual protection for these states against, amongst others, China, is seriously compromised by these moves. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are all members of the CSTO, and Uzbekistan was until 2012. While mostly the CSTO has been as much, much used as a chocolate fire guard, it's only deployed troops once in its whole existence, and then that was to help Kazakhstan crush internal dissent. There are some serious military as well as economic implications. I mean, Moscow has peacekeeper forces, which are labelled as CSTO forces, on the ground in a number of these states, tamping down ethnic rivalries and border disputes. And it's very unclear whether or not China would be able or indeed willing to do the same kind of thing if it became the primary mover in the area. 
China's inexperience in complex international situations like this does tell against it. And whilst it was able to broker the recent Iran-Saudi diplomatic relations love-in, it's never been involved in a multi-way, complex, ethnic situation like the ones that it would find in Central Asia, where there simply are no good outcomes to be had. Personally, I think Xi has entirely the wrong temperament for this kind of thing. But that didn't stop him the moment he left Moscow, inviting his new girls round for a party in Beijing. Truly, Putin has put his cock in a vice with his war in Ukraine. And China, despite making some noises about peace plans, is actually quite happy to take advantage of Russia's weakness. The second big implication of BRI is internal to China. The northwestern province of Xinjiang is the key gateway for the overland Belt and Road stuff, but it's also a bit of a wild west, not least because China is like big, it's biggerly big, y'all. It's a 27 hour drive from Beijing to Uru, Urumaki, 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 this, this, this place, this place, that one, that one, yeah, yeah. According to Beijing, Xinjiang is crawling with terrorists and Muslim extremists, which it's used as an excuse to do a genocide on over one million Uyghurs, locking them up indefinitely without trial for re-education. Somewhat unsurprisingly, this has provoked more than a few armed groups to filter backwards and forwards across the Afghan border to blow up stuff like, for example, China's shiny new pipelines and in the name of Islam. And if we remember again that China is a communist state, which by and large frowns on the concept of religion and really doesn't get it as a motivating force, despite everything we talked about previously with Confucianism, Islam is completely outside the norms for what China considers to be acceptable behaviour for its citizens. So by fostering relationships with Central Asian states, and in particular with Tajikistan, China hopes to remove some potential places of sanctuary for what it thinks of as an internal Muslim threat. If this region isn't fully secured, then the whole of China's Asian policy will fail, and hence they're quite happy to commit a spot of ethnic cleansing to secure it all. All of this is a huge challenge to the US, and probably inevitably so. You know, The last time that the US had a near-peer competitor in the form of the Soviet Union, it reacted very badly indeed, and the two sides wind, wind up pointing the better part of 30,000 nuclear warheads at one another. But things haven't got that bad with China, at least not yet, not least because of that $550 billion trade relationship, which of course never happened with the USSR. But both sides do misunderstand one another to an almost comical degree. You know, China genuinely thinks America's protestations of liberty and freedom are window dressing and that no one in the US really believes in those things. It discounts it as a cause for conflict and thinks of it as an excuse to just try and keep China down. The US, by contrast, can't understand why China hasn't transformed to look like the US does. And it assumes that its path, the United States approach to democracy and capitalism, is the only viable one for any country. And the fact that China hasn't done that is deeply confusing to it. Of course, I both I think they're both entirely mad, as there's only one sensible way to run a state, and that's to have a part German hereditary monarch with an unwritten constitution which prevents that monarch from actually doing anything more dangerous than, say, opening a packet of crisps on a Tuesday. But there you go. The point here is quite serious because China can't see the US's point of view and vice versa. When the war in Ukraine broke out, it was widely assumed within China that the US was seeking to repress Russia by supplying arms. They just can't get their heads around an ideological reason for the US acting. Whilst it's happy to claim its, its borders are inviolable, it's much less concerned about Ukraine's borders because, broadly speaking, Russia's defeat would damage China by bolstering the US's influence. In a multipolar world, really, China needs a strong Russia and a weaker US. There's no question that China's leadership was genuinely shocked by the world's reaction to Ukraine. And whilst, as we've discussed, Xi has managed to play a bit of a blinder by lifting his skirts up and showing some leg to Putin but going no further, it does put China in something of a quandary as to what to do about Taiwan and the other so-called lost territories which were controlled in the dim and distant past by the Qing dynasty. At the same time, there have been very serious challenges to China's economy as a whole, which is further worrying Beijing and kind of limiting its scope for international adventurism. So let's talk about some of those challenges. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the argument you heard a lot from the US in particular was that if you got China into the World Trade Organization, once it was in, the natural market economics of capitalism would push China towards democratic change. The thinking went that if people had stopped having to stitch footballs with their teeth and felt the fruits of capitalism at their fingertips, communism would lose its attraction, just like it had done in, in Russia 10 years before. And as you might have noticed, that's not what happened. Look, let's forgive the pre-9-11 folks. We all kind of thought we'd be living in underwater cities by now and we would have 
flying cars. And it turns out that actually what we're trying to do most of the time is stave off existential crisis and imminent nuclear Armageddon. So fun times for all. Instead of doing a democracy, China put the literal red light on above its street corner, showed off its 1.4 billion strong potential market, its cheap labour costs, and then, when international business got interested, wound the window down and asked how much for a blowjob, China produced its police ID card, confiscated all of their IP, and arrested them for soliciting. And this worked for a long time. Whilst China's GDP per capita barely scrapes into the top 70 nations of the world behind such powerhouses as Botswana, Azerbaijan and Belarus, it did see huge growth and the rise of a wealthy middle class for the first time. In what China might call tier one cities, life has altered for the better for a very decent chunk of the people. China's absolute GDP growth throughout the 2000s regularly topped 10%, and between 2003 and 2023, total GDP has gone from about 1.6 trillion to 6 trillion. Even during the economic collapse of 2008, China was showing more than a 9% growth rate, well ahead of any Western-style economy. The value of the whole of Russia's economy is less than Guizhing's, for example. But there are some serious buts in here, and not the fun jiggly kind. First, since 2010, the growth figures have been in decline, dropping to just 2.2% pre-pandemic. Secondly, those figures, and indeed really all figures coming out of China, are deeply flawed. The all-encompassing state where party officials can and indeed do wind up in jail for giving unwelcome news has led to massively exaggerated growth data over an extended period of time. You know, if you find yourself as a local party economic boss with a job of reporting data upwards and you realise there's either an error or a blatant lie in the data from your predecessor, you don't want to be the one that suddenly downward, downwardly forecasts growth. So you simply incorporate those false numbers into your own. Plus, of course, you want to get promoted. You need to show growth. So you make these bet these figures better than the previous guy so that you can get that promotion rather than you know, disappearing. So this has been going on for quite a long time to the extent that even the party leadership no longer trusts the data that's coming in from the regions. All the signs are even allowing for flaws in the data that China is not growing at anything like as fast as it was. Indeed, it might actually already be in some kind of recession or near recession situation, and it may have been for up to two years. And this poses a serious question for the military and for the civil society. What happens when the people no longer feel the benefits of economic growth, just the heavy hand of state repression? And what happens if they start asking why exactly has the government lent billions of dollars to other countries and lost that cash whilst not supporting the standard of living for, say, the rural masses or even for the majority of the urban poor? The COVID protests of 2022 shocked many ordinary Chinese who've been so used to the idea that no one could express themselves in public, and it scared the crap out of the leadership too. Hence, a very quick reversal in policy. The Hong Kong protests have basically died down from their peak in 2019, but China has had essentially to put the island in lockdown, cripple the economy, remove any kind of form of local government ownership, and literally occasionally turn the power off in order to regain control. The fact that protests spread as far and as fast as they did during the COVID tensions does point to serious issues within certain bits of society, and the economic pressures that could come be coming down the line will make things a lot worse. Xi does not have the freedom of action that he had pre-pandemic. And of course, China is not a uniform, tension-free society. There are ethnic and cultural tensions and splits which pose serious threats to the nation's cohesion too. And there's also a significant demographic change going on. You know, The impacts of the one-child policy from the 1980s and 1990s has led to an increasingly ageing population. And this is going to significantly increase the cost of things like healthcare and, of course, state pensions, which essentially everybody relies on. There is no culture within China of having private pensions, really, to speak of. It's also going to, of course, push down productivity in manufacturing, which has been the bedrock of all of China's economic growth, really, since the war. Add to that, there's been massive wage inflation in particularly key cities, which means China is no longer the cheapest place to make things, and spooked investors that are beginning to pull out, and massive repatriation schemes from the US and the EU, who for this year alone will spend something like half a trillion dollars pulling companies and IP out of China. Another very serious factor of the economy is food. 
And with an aging population, with mass migration to cities over the last 40 years, and with an emphasis on educating young people so that they no longer want to work in the fields, China's domestic food production has dropped far behind demand, and it's been a net importer of food for some time. However, the war in Ukraine has caused a spike in world energy costs, and that, of course, in turn has driven up world food prices. A good example, a ton of rice in December 21 was about $400. Now it's more like $460. Wheat has gone from about $300 per ton in July of 2021 to more like $400 now. And this is also being exacerbated by significant challenges with production internally in China. Global warming is having an immediate and obvious impact across the whole of China example, pictures of the Pearl River, which had nearly dried up at the end of last summer, there were significant heat waves which impacted production, and then serious flooding which followed it. This saw massive losses to crops. For the first time in several generations, food security inside China is under genuine pressure. Now, I don't think that's something that's going to boil over, and I think China can recover, but the war in Ukraine is not bloody helping. So if you take a lot of these factors together, if you take the apparent failure of the BRI program, general global economic slowdown, a local Chinese economic slowdown, a return to Marxist values, the pull out of foreign direct investment, domestic unrest, the Chinese economy is not looking in the greatest of places. And it doesn't necessarily have the money left over to fund, I don't know, let's say just for the sake of argument, pitting a hypothetical off the top of my head, a massive investment in high-tech weaponry and wars of expansion into the Pacific. So should we talk about the PLA now? guns go burr. Probably the biggest single concern that most people have is around China's military intentions, and the expansion of the PLA is pretty scary. They've been building and buying some pretty cool hardware for a while now. In 1999, they had maybe 10 submarines. 24 years later, they have over 130. In 1999, they had no aircraft carriers. Now they have three. Well, technically two, because one of them is a copy of the Admiral Knetsov and is therefore as much use as a condom in a convent. But it can sort of, I guess, float around and soak up a few US standoff weapons. They have true fourth and fifth generation fighters, new Bane battle tanks, new nukes. They have maybe 160 surface vessels. Every single year, China's Navy is growing by the same size as the entirety of the Royal Navy, for example. And this pace of modernization and expansion is the outward expression of Xi Jinping's increasing muscle on the world stage. Xi has reportedly instructed his military to modernize entirely by 2035 and to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. Given that it is assumed that China wants to have its rightful place back at the world, top of the world in time for the 2049 100th anniversary of the Communist Revolution, the steps that Xi are taking appear, militarily anyway, logical. We are in what has been referred to in some quarters as the decade of maximum danger. According to various defence analysts, were China to make the first move on Taiwan, it would take the US about three weeks to bring overwhelming support and firepower to bear on the conflict, and it would cost the lives of perhaps 500,000 people. And of course, it could go nuclear. And it's worth bearing in mind then that China's military hasn't really done a great deal since the end of the Civil War, except kill protesters. Its last big fight was with Vietnam, which it pretty comprehensively lost in 1979. So whilst Xi might be under pressure to use his new military before it gets rusty, doing so has some very serious downsides, and it's far from certain that it would go in his favour were Taiwan to hold out. Indeed, Chinese own internal military analysts reckon that they would need to take the island inside 48 hours or lose the war. That's a hell of a gamble. And the war in Ukraine has suddenly focused the West on Taiwan in a way that probably hasn't been focused on it for, let's say, two decades. And although China has many allies, it's created many enemies using the BRI program, some of whom are quite prepared to ignore the constant saber-rattling, overflights, missile tests and general fuckery to supply weapons which, if they couldn't stop the Chinese military, would certainly fuck them up if they were put in the hands of a determined army or militia. And Taiwan itself is rapidly reforming its army. It looks increasingly like a hard target. On top of which, there are, of course, the financial challenges. When you tool up like this and invest in tanks and aircraft and ships and nuclear weapons and so on, there's an immediate capital outlay. But the bit that's often forgotten, as we've all seen in Russia, is you've got to maintain it. If you've ever bought a car, then the costs of servicing of fuel, tax, tyres, insurance and some fly-looking body kits can come as a bit of a shock. 
whilst you probably don't need to put a tricked up sound system into your tank, you do need to put fuel in it and replace the parts that Private Wang has knocked off when he ran over the Commandant's car. So, for example, British Aircraft Carrier Program cost about 7.6 billion to build two ships, but the carriers themselves actually only cost 20% of the projected lifetime costs. The rest is running costs and maintenance and upgrades and services and so on. Thus, China is looking at a defence budget which it can either grow by, let's say, 50 to 75% over the next 10 years, or it can do 50 to 75% less with the same budget. President Xi's announcement of a 7.8% increase isn't going to cut the mustard. And if the economy, as we've just discussed, is fucked, growing that budget comes at the cost of people's standard of living, especially if you've lent your reserves to some tin pot dictator who's fucked off with them. Eventually, as the US, quite fair to say that that there's a budget in there which is a lot bigger than the 225 billion suggests. And if you are a member of the US police force feeling a little bit smug about having got your plate carrier and an M60, think again, because the PAP, for example, have their own artillery units, just what you need for arresting shoplifters. There's another important lesson that Xi may well have drawn from Ukraine, which should be causing him to give some of his generals some serious side eye. And of course, that's corruption. The good old fashioned practice of bribing one's way to the top has become more dangerous in recent times in China. Xi knows only too well himself, but it is still going on at a mind boggling scale for any outsider looking in. Vast quantities of stuff can and does go missing in China in mysterious ways every day, especially within the Communist Party itself. Whilst the military almost certainly isn't as bad as Russia's in this regard, China's slate is far from clean. The most high-profile corruption arrests in military circles was in 2020 with the detention of Hu Wemin, who had been the CEO and party secretary of China Shipbuilding Industry Corporation, CSIC. This was the primary contractor making China's new aircraft carriers. There's no question that a goodly chunk of money earmarked for defence is definitely getting magically transformed into international property portfolios, BMWs, luxury yachts, and get-the-fuck-out-of-here funds. Now I'm going to indulge in a little bit of pure speculation and wishful thinking, but it's fun. This is my video. You've come with me this far, so bear with. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that China does definitely want to show that it is once again the seat of the heavenly kingdom of all civilization, communism, good, one China, multipolar world, yada, yada, yada. Well, it's got Hong Kong, so big fucking tick there, even if it has gone about as well as farting in a lift. Taiwan is, well, let's say fucking tricky, and you can sort of squint and declare victory there. After all, there is only one China, which you've been saying for years, so kind of let's just gloss over that bit. But you've got this bloody great big army, the 100th anniversary is coming up, you need to blow a few rounds off and get a nice easy victory, maybe as a bit of a warm-up for Taiwan. There is another bit of territory a very nice bit of territory actually, stuffed full of economic resources like oil and clean water and rare earth minerals, uranium and a big deep water port facing off into the Sea of Japan. I can't shake the idea that Xi might just be tempted to make the region of outer Manchuria, the one that China lost to Russia in the 1860s, a part of greater China once again. It's not like Putin could stop them right now. Their army consists of a confused bunch of Siberian sheep farmers and a couple of tanks that have been hauled out of museums, whereas China has some serious modern military that could, and indeed should, cut through it like a chopstick through tofu. If I was Daddy P, I would be watching my back very, very fucking carefully. Okay, so let's put that speculation to one side. Let's talk about possibilities of a clash with the US. I personally don't think it's that likely. If it did happen, at best, it would put a really serious strain on an already faltering Chinese economy. It would expose serious weaknesses in Chinese society, and there's an excellent chance the Chinese Communist Party would be kicked out of power if it failed. Wars change regimes, often in ways that involve lampposts and walls. And Xi is not a man who's given to those sorts of risks, even if there are hotheads within the CCP and the PLA who might be willing to give it a bash. He's never going to walk away from the position which says that there's only one China and that Taiwan is a part of it. I just don't think he's going to do anything about it. And the US doesn't want to fight over Taiwan either, if it can possibly avoid it. And there's a bloody good reason that the US has never committed to absolutely defining what it would do in the event of a PRC attack on on Taiwan. It's maintained what it refers to as strategic ambiguity. And whilst there are a number of commanders I know who find that quite difficult to cope with, I actually think that is the smart move to make. Keep the other guy guessing and don't do anything too aggressive. 
whilst I absolutely think both sides assume that the other is purely acting cynically and disregard one another's ideological imperatives, I also think this is a game that isn't worth the candle for either side, at least not in the short term. That won't stop them fucking with one another or pulling each other's tails with things like overflights and the stupid balloon flights and deployments of naval units to within an inch of in international waters and radar sweeps and missile tests and God knows what else. But actual shooting, I don't think is desperately likely. The big unknown is, of course, Ukraine. She seems to have blown hot and cold on this, and he's got his so-called peace plan, which basically says everybody be nice, but didn't actually make any concrete proposals either to President Zelensky or indeed to President Putin. Honestly, China has no real experience in trying to negotiate a peace in something as messy and multi-level as the situation in Ukraine. It doesn't really get culturally the importance of what to it looks like arbitrary lines on a map which is a bit fucking ironic, given the whole thing about Taiwan. Anyway, President Macron's visit to Beijing does not fill me with much hope, not least because <laughs> he's going whilst France is literally on fire due to dumbass decisions he's made domestically. In recent French history, probably only de Gaulle has upset as many world leaders as Macron has, and de Gaulle did at least fight the Nazis for a bit. So far, Macron has variously pissed off the Germans, the US, Mali, the UK, which I will concede was a 50-50 thing to do with collective suicide over Brexit, Lebanon, Australia, and of course turned up in Moscow just in time to make sure that Putin did actually invade Ukraine. Hoping that he would somehow get Xi into a peace plan feels a bit far-fetched, and frankly, I'll be quite pleased if Macron can come home without accidentally starting a nuclear war. I digress, but the point is Xi's interests in Ukraine are really about trying to stop the US winning, it means it's unlikely we're going to see Chinese official support for Russia either. We won't see Chinese guns or tanks or planes suddenly turning up in the Ukraine conflict. Because you know what? Truth absolutely be told. From China's point of view, whilst it doesn't want Russia humiliated and destroyed, it doesn't particularly care if Russia's terribly weakened. Ideally, what it wants to see is the US and Russia weaken one another so that China can appear strong. I think that's probably a good place to leave things for now. We've talked history, we've talked politics, personalities, penal codes, pussycats and peace, and I hope that you've enjoyed this. And I'll be back in a month or so with something completely different for you to shout at me about. I've put a bunch of links down the bottom here. If you have questions, do by all means ask them in the comments. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon.